You know an earthquake is probably one of the scariest things you can ever experience. I'm Fritz Coleman from KNBC Los Angeles, and I'm here to assure you that despite all the noise and all the shaking and all the confusion, there's a lot you can learn and prepare for to assure you and your family's safety. Because the more information and training you have, the less there is to be afraid of. This video will take you through the before, during, and after of this monumental event. Here's a menu to illustrate how we've organized the information. It's simple, easy to follow, and in a single weekend, you and your family can be better prepared. This is your typical suburban neighborhood. Kind of place where all the neighbors know one another, help each other with life's little problems. But during an earthquake, all that's gonna change. It's your job to be fully prepared and to calmly carry on despite anything Mother Nature throws at you. Hey, slow down your kids in this neighborhood. California straddles two of the Earth's giant tectonic plates, the Pacific and North American. Look, there will always be earthquakes in California. Most of them are not serious ones. Scientists are working to better understand and predict them and to develop structures more capable of withstanding even extreme seismic activity. You need to be prepared and to take responsibility for yourself and your loved ones. Of course, there are places you can live where there aren't earthquakes, like Buffalo. <laughs> you decide. Conventional, single-story, wood-frame homes are usually the most resistant to an earthquake. A structural engineer can advise you and help you to determine how your home will be affected and what steps to take to make it safer. The foundations are an important place to check, and a great deal can be done to strengthen them. Let's take a closer look now in this report from Rick Chambers. If you are planning to buy or lease a home soon, newer may be better. Building codes are updated every three years, and while some contractors may enhance their projects a bit, most use a uniform code adopted by the state. The rest of us as local jurisdictions are allowed to make minor amendments, but essentially from a structural point of view and building design factors, yes, we're all on the same dance card. And if you have a choice, go with a slab foundation. It's solid. But if your home has a raised foundation, make sure the foundation plate is bolted to the concrete. They should find bolts every six feet along the foundation wall and 12 inches from the corner. Take a wrench down. If you've got them bolted, tighten up on the bolts. Right. What about these, the piers? The piers underneath here yeah. should have some type of a diagonal bracing, usually a one by four. And it should come down from the girder, yeah. and it should go diagonally down to the base of the pier. And that'll keep on, it from dropping off. And the... that'll keep the pier post from coming off of the pier pad. Being prepared is going to take time effort and money but the reward will be saving thousands of dollars in damage or maybe saving lives getting ready for an earthquake is like preparing for any activity fishing golf whatever it's about being equipped with the right gear and knowing where things are when you need them now since you never know where you're going to be when an earthquake hits let's consider a few of the possibilities the average person spends over half their time at home so let's start there most earthquake injuries happen as a result of something falling. There's a lot you can do to protect yourself and to make sure your belongings stay put when the ground starts shaking. So we talked with Tom Runberg, who has become a recognized expert on affordable earthquake fastening products. It's true. Most injuries in earthquakes are caused as a result of falling objects. What you need to do to make your home more safe is to anchor down hazardous items. If you follow me, I'll show you what I mean. If you have a personal computer in the home, you should secure it. I'm securing this one by using a buckle fastener. You simply stick it on like this, and it's secured. It's very easy to do. If you need to remove the computer for any reason, you simply pull down on the buckle, do the same thing on the other side, and lift it up. When you put it back again, 
You simply slip the nylon strap back in, do this again on both sides, and it's secure. Television sets are secured pretty much the same way that computers are. You use a buckle fastener on either side, but because of the top heaviness of TVs, we use a nylon strap that's attached to the table behind it and to the top with industrial Velcro. This way, you keep the TV from coming forward like this. Your VCR is really important, especially if you want to see this video again in the future. Now, what we're doing here is we're putting four Velcro blocks underneath the VCR. We peel off the release paper, which exposes the adhesive, and then you simply put it down and press. And because it's Velcro, if you ever want to remove it, you simply grab one corner and peel it up. To secure this tall wall unit, we're using black nylon straps that are bolted into the wall studs and then bolted through the top of the wall unit. When you have a bookcase where the top is below eye level, you can secure the strap to the bottom of the top and then secure it to the wall behind the bookcase so that you don't see the straps. To keep our books in place, we use the Boing Bar. It got its name because of the sound that it makes. It's bungee cord that's screwed into the walls on the sides of the bookcase. We don't use hooks. To hold crystal and figurines in place, we use quake hold, which is a specially formulated putty. You simply put it on the bottom of an item and push it down on the shelf, and it stays. It really works. Now, moving on to the bedroom, notice we have only soft art above the bed. It wouldn't hurt you if it falls, and our bookcases are secured with nylon straps. Mirrors are real important because they're made of glass and they're heavy. This mirror has been secured with two eye bolts and a quick link. Here in our kitchen, we have a lot of countertop appliances. We've secured our microwave using a steel brace with industrial Velcro. In order to keep our dishes from winding up on the floor after an earthquake, we've installed these special cupboard locks. The way you open them is you simply pull out on the knob about a quarter of an inch. It unlocks the lock. When you close it, you simply push it shut, and it's locked. It's a piece of cake. Now, some people like to use the child-proof latches. These weren't really designed as an earthquake safety device, and they're not as handy, but they can be used. In our laundry room, the washer and dryer are strapped in. This is especially important if the dryer is gas-operated. If the earthquake moves the dryer away from the wall, it can break the gas line and cause a fire hazard. Take a look at this, Fritz. This is our family Richter scale. We measure the power of an earthquake by the number of cups that fall. The Whittier quake was a three-cupper. Now the Northridge quake, we lost nine of these babies. Thanks, Tom. I think I lost every one of mine except this one. When guests come, we have to share. Now, here in the kitchen, there's a lot more you can do to prepare for the next cup shaker. Like Refrigerators can cause a real mess. If it has wheels, make sure they're locked. Make sure that large, heavy objects are moved to lower shelves and not hanging up, because in a quake, this frying pan becomes a guided missile. Now, artwork is great, but not over your bed. Then it can become a lethal weapon. It's a good idea to replace all glass with plexiglass. You can use special earthquake hooks, or you can just close the regular hooks by squeezing them with pliers. Whatever you use, one thing to always remember, make sure you're nailing into a stud. Ow, sounds so painful. Did you know you can have a professional come to install safety film on large windows or patio doors to prevent shattering? But by closing your curtains or blinds, it'll act as a buffer for you. Hey, turn the lights on, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, it's true that during an emergency, things are not quite that simple. The thing to do is have a flashlight in every single room of your home and have loads of extra batteries on hand, too. A power failure light, the kind that comes on when the power goes off, with a plug-in flashlight is a very important safety aid. Speaking of light, let's take a look at your utilities. All family members should know the location of all your utilities so they'll be ready to respond to an emergency quickly. Kevin Schoes of DWP is here to help me figure out my fuse box because I am electrically challenged. 
Now, Kevin, the first thing I want to know is where is that one on-off switch you can use? Okay, this is your breaker box with your circuit breakers. This is the main switch. But before you do anything with your electrical panel, anytime you're dealing with energized circuits, you want to make sure you have gloves and safety glasses on, if, okay. you, if they have these available. Uh -huh. Okay, locate your meter in the breaker box like this. Now, the first thing you want to do <coughs> is shut off your circuit breakers one at a time. Okay, like so. All the way up, and then flip the main switch off okay. at the top. Individual ones first, then the main switch. Correct. Okay. When the power comes back on again, make sure everything in your house is off, or, or your, your large uh, load items in the house are off, at least, and then reverse the procedure. Okay. And one at a time. Main switch first. Main switch first, then turn on your circuit breakers. Okay. One at a time, slowly. Okay. Now, if you live in an apartment, you're going to have a panel box like this somewhere inside the apartment. The meter won't be there. But somewhere, usually in a hallway, you're going to have a panel just like this, and it's going to look exactly like this, same procedure. Okay, for people who, say, are new homeowners or aren't real familiar with their home, how do you locate this on your house? Okay, the electric meter is usually located on the perimeter of the house, um, directly beneath your service drop, wherever that enters your house. Now, if you have an underground service, the meter is going to be outside somewhere towards the front of the house. Okay, great. Now, can you help me with my water? No problem. Let's do it. I think it's this way. <laughs> here it is right here in plain sight, Kevin. A lot of them aren't this easy to find, though, are they? No, they aren't. The first thing you want to do is locate your water meter. There's a number of ways to do that. Usually the easiest is if they're obvious like this. Mm -hmm. They're not always going to be like this. Sometimes they're going to have a, a round top box. Sometimes they're going to be covered with ivy. If you can't locate your meter right off the bat, there's a couple ways of doing it. One way is to check the curb. There might be a T carved in the, in the curb itself that marks the meter. If there's no T, what you want to do is, is locate the point where your plumbing enters the house, come in a straight line out to the street. Usually the meter is, is somewhere in that vicinity. Incidentally, we ought to add that before you come to the street meter, it's always easier to turn things off at the house, right? There's, there are two ways to turn your service off, one at the house, one here at the meter. The house is the easiest, but this is probably the, uh, the most effective way to All turn right. off your water. Let's open this thing up and see how we do this here. There we go. All right. Okay, what you want to have is a water key. This is called a water key. You can usually buy this at any hardware store. They sell a smaller version of it. Um, just keep that on your keychain, right? <laughs> you want to place it right over the valve, like so, and then turn the valve at a 90 degree angle to your water line. That'll shut off the service. Just like the gas line, exactly. perpendicular to it. Same principle. Then when you're finished, you can turn your own service back on. Oh, that's if you determine you don't have any leaks, you don't have to have us come out to turn it back on. You can do it yourself if you have this tool. But just in case, can I have your home phone number? Now, let's move on to gas. Inside your house, use flexible hose to attach your gas appliances to the outlet. And be sure to fasten them to the stud in the wall with straps or plumber's tape. This will help prevent ruptured gas and water lines. The gas valve requires an adjustable wrench. You should store it in a plastic bag to protect it, and you may want to put some oil on it to keep it from rusting. And then you can roll it up with one single strip of duct tape, tape it to the side or the back of the gas meter so you can quickly grab it. And then you should be familiar with a quarter turn shut off as well. This is Carlos Cuevas from the Southern California Gas Company is going to teach us what we need to know. Carlos, when do we turn the gas off, first of all? Well, before coming to the meter and turning off the gas, you want to check your appliances. Listen and smell. If you hear or smell the gas leaking at the appliance, you may be able to isolate that appliance from the valve behind or underneath it. So be familiar not only with where your outside main valve is, but the individual gas appliance shutoff valves in the house. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, if you can't isolate it within the house and you still hear or smell, then you can come out and grab your wrench, place it securely on the valve. Okay, now I notice one thing. Your wrench is bigger than my wrench. A bigger one is better, right, so it's quick and easier to manipulate. Exactly. A larger wrench is going to give you more leverage. Sometimes the valves are kind of tight and harder to turn. Mm -hmm. If they've been in the on position for a long time, they tend to get stuck there. So okay. if you have a larger wrench, you'll have more leverage and be able to turn it a lot easier. All right. So you place it securely on. Turn the valve so it's perpendicular with the pipe, and that'll cut off your gas supply to the house. Now, the key is, unlike a water valve, I can't turn my gas valve back on. It has to be you or a licensed contractor or a plumber, right? 
Yeah, we don't recommend you trying it yourself because if there's damage somewhere inside the house, we'll be able to tell by shutting off all the lines within the house and using the test hands on the meter to check to see if there's any leakage inside. Plus, we'll go in and service all the appliances to make sure the earthquake hasn't damaged them, like shifting furnaces, the vent pipes that have separated that could conceivably cause greater problems down the line, such as CO poisoning, fire hazards, and things like that. Great, Carlos. Thank you very much. You. All right, let's go check on smoke detectors now. Remember to check your smoke detectors and change your batteries every time you change to and from daylight savings time. Now, the batteries you take out won't be run down, so use them with your kids' toys. Better to have a run-down computer game than a run-down smoke detector. And in case of fire, always have a fire extinguisher handy in your house and know how to use it. I don't know how to use it, so come with me and let's learn. Hello, Captain. Thanks for being with us today. Sure. First of all, what kind of unit should people buy for their home? Well, the best thing that they can buy is a ABC all-purpose powder extinguisher. This one is a five pound. You can also get a two and three quarter pound. This is the one that we recommend. It puts out all fires, whether it's ordinary combustibles, flammable liquids, or electrical before it's disconnected. Now, a lot of people have these in their home, but have never had occasion to use one in their lifetime. Let's instruct them on how to use it. Well, the first thing you want to do is read the instructions. Every extinguisher has a full set of instructions that show you exactly how to use it. Like with this one, the first thing we will do is we will loosen up the hose. We will pull the pin, the safety pin out, get ready to press the trigger. As we walk towards the fire, we aim at the base of the fire with a sweeping action and turning on the charge. Once the fire is out, we start backing off. We do not stop the, the uh, discharge of the powder until we get back a ways, and then it's all over. And I'm actually going to put out this fire. You certainly are. I have been deputized by the Burbank Fire Department to extinguish this particular blaze. You're our firefighter of the day. <laughs> Before we do that, we ought to tell people that if you don't have a fire extinguisher, and if by some miracle you still have water pressure after a quake, you can use a garden hose to put out a fire. That's right. You want to always have a garden hose hooked to a faucet right near one of your uh, entrance doors, and you should always have a controllable nozzle on it. And be aware that during an earthquake, that first 72 hours, you're going to be on your own. Ta-da! <laughs> Can I get some H2O? Water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. You know, during a serious emergency, water may be cut off for days, or it may become polluted for weeks. You can never have too much of it. You should have two quarts to one gallon per person per day, and allow for seven to 14 days supply. Tap water in sterilized plastic containers lasts about six months. A date on a calendar or the bottle should be a reminder to change it. Some commercially bottled water may last a little bit longer. After a year or so, though, sometimes it tastes a little plasticky but it's still okay to drink. Mmm. Ooh, I would guess west end of the valley, south of Ventura Boulevard, late March, early April. Whew, wonderful. Food, of course, is the other major requirement. Have extra canned and dried food on hand, but note the expiration dates. We'll have a spoilage chart at the end of this tape. High-tech food is another way to go. It's more compact, and has a longer shelf life. Every home should be equipped with at least one survival kit. Let's see how earthquake gear expert Bill Hunt puts one of these survival kits together for us. Hi, Bill. Hi, Fritz. Now listen, we're going to do this in three sections with these kits. We're going to do the under the bed kit. Right. We're going to do the office slash car kit. Right. And then the big home slash big family kit. Correct. The very end. All right, let's get started. Okay, the first kit that everyone should have next to your bed or by a door is the grab-and-go kit. This kit will have everything that you'll need immediately after an earthquake. Of course, the first thing you should have in it is some type of clothing, because if you were sleeping, uh, you probably have pajamas on, you want something a little bit more comfortable. Ziploc bags to Ziploc keep them dry. Ziploc bags, right, okay. to keep it dry. Next thing is a comfortable pair of shoes to protect your feet. Next thing you should have is you should have a flashlight and, of course, extra batteries. How about putting the batteries in a plastic uh, Ziploc deal, too? Do that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, next thing you should have is some sort of communications, whether it be an AM radio or something. We recommend a solar crank radio 
Uh, that way you've got crank power, solar power, and of course extra batteries. Now these aren't too common. Where could you get one of those? Uh, most survival stores have them. I think some of the sporting goods stores are carrying them now, mm -hmm. as well as any earthquake preparedness store. Uh, the other items that you should have in a Ziploc bag would be some coins for phone calls, some photos of your children. Now what's uh, this for? Why the, why the photo? Uh, a couple reasons. One, it can be for like your own moral support. And secondly, if your child is missing, either separate or whatever, right. you can give a photo to the police. Mm -hmm. What about these phone numbers? These phone numbers that we recommend is like an out-of-state contact, uh, like your parents or um, a friend that's out-of-state, so that you have an out-of-state link mm -hmm. so other people can call. Uh, your children's schools numbers, in addition to that, uh, your insurance agent's number and your policy number would be good. Additionally, in here, you could put a copy of your uh, insurance policy and any, any other important documents. And of course, as far as I'm concerned, there's no reason to survive without these right here. That's right. If you wear glasses, uh, most likely in the shaking, your glasses are going to fall off the nightstand. And if you run outside without glasses, you're not going to see very much. So you, it's very important if you wear glasses to put an extra pair in there. Okay. Almost as important, if not more important, in the glasses is if you take any kind of medication that you have that medication inside of a bag along with some other first aid items. Doesn't need to be too elaborate, just some basic first aid products. Now does this mean that you, if you have a prescription like an antibiotic or something, you should just automatically take some out of the existing bottle and put some in there, not the full supply, but enough to get you through a couple exactly, of days? Exactly, through a couple days, because you never know. If you are uh, dislocated from an earthquake, then probability of the pharmacy and your doctor is the same type of situation. Okay. Very important to have that. And when they ever present. Swiss Army knife. Yeah. Uh -huh. Multiple uses for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, a watch. watch. In case, again, your watch was next to your glasses on the nightstand, uh, you can get outside. You'll have some type of uh, time reference. And I love these, the old space blanket. Exactly. It retains 90% of your body heat, mm -hmm. and it's compact. And it do, you don't need to put a big blanket in there. Extra keys, house and car, right? House and car. In addition, we recommend that you put your safety deposit key on there as well. Uh-huh. Okay. If you have to go to the bank and take your funds out yourself. That's exactly. That's my biggest fear. And, of course, something to write with. Right. It'd be easy to forget that. A little packet of water mm -hmm. in case, you know, you don't have a water supply too quickly. The idea of this kit is not necessarily to replace a, a kit that you can make yourself or purchase one of the ready-made kits, but to augment that kit as well. Now you have a duplicate flashlight in case the tembler knocks this thing somewhere where you can't find it. Exactly. In the dark, right? It's and attached to your bag. Tie wrapped to your bag right. and also for safety. Right. You have a, a whistle so that, that way if someone has to search for you for one reason or another, no matter how tired you are or out of breath from yelling, you'll have enough breath to blow a whistle. Give your kids used to that sound and they'll know that to follow that sound when, if, if you get separated. Exactly. From All righty. Now, this is the kit that you would find in the car, have this in the trunk of the car, and just kind of forget about it, or in your office in Correct. the bottom desk drawer or something. Mm -hmm. Fanny pack. Right, so right. that way it's ease of uh, carry. Your hands are free in case you've got to climb or, or crawl. It's very important to have that. Mm -hmm. You can have a backpack version as well. What is this, about a week's worth of water for? Uh, it's three days for uh -huh. one person. Uh, there's alternate water that you can add or add to the kits. But you can also put compact. a couple of bottles of Avion or something in the trunk, exactly. too. Exactly for a period of time. And how often do you have to replace these packets? That has a five-year shelf life. Uh -huh. the same with the food that we're going to yes, see in a minute? Yes, exactly. Okay, good. What else? Oh, you have the snap lights. Mm -hmm. uh, these are pretty easy to use. Uh, you just snap it, shake it to two chemicals mix, and cause an illumination. Uh, this is good to have in case you're in a building and you're not sure if there's gas or, or something like that. There's no spark or anything. It's just exactly. a chemical reaction. Okay, these are first aid supplies, obviously. Right. Gauze pads, adhesive tape, band-aids. Uh, a moist towelette in case right. you have ribs yes. in the time of emergency, of course. What is this? Extra uh, it's gauze? Just, uh, oh, facial uh, tissue. tissue. And these are? The solar blanket oh, again. Okay. And in all three kits, under all circumstances, the old pair of gloves, exactly. right? Exactly. Because during an earthquake, you can expect a certain amount of debris and broken glass, so it's very wise to have a pair of gloves in every kit. Good idea would be maybe to take one of these pairs and put them in the shoes so that when you grab the shoes, you put the gloves on if you have to move anything out of the way to get out of your house. Exactly. Hour. Here's the bigger flashlight. Right. This flashlight here can hold a charge. In addition, it's got a radio on the side, and it has a crank as well, so that, that way if the battery runs down, you can crank it. Great. And how about this? Uh, these are like a waste bags. You can use them for body waste or for uh, trash, you know, your expendables here. Okay. Now here's what I've been dying to try. 
you have these giant blocks. Right. If, if your home is destroyed, you can actually build a new home out of these blocks That's of food, right. can't you? Now, it looks, I, I might tell you, not really appetizing. It looks like a combination of trail mix and suet. And I saved my opportunity to taste this until I could do it right now on camera for you, just to see how it is. I've heard it's not bad. And it really isn't. It's very good. It's like some sort of a dessert bar. Right. And it's protein and... Right. It has a... It's 3,600 calories. It's one of these blocks is good for one person for three days. Mm -hmm. uh, the advantages are it's lightweight and it has a five-year shelf life, whereas canned food uh, tends to have a shorter shelf life and weighs a lot more. Okay. Excuse me. This office and car. Correct. Put it in the trunk. Forget about it. This for the home. Right. First of all, where in the home would you put this? I would recommend put it, once you've, uh, your family's decided what your exit points will be, um, I'd put it by that door. And that way you can grab it as you go. As you can see, it's a bag. It's got handles. And it's got everything self-contained. So grab it as you're exiting out of the door. And it really is just more of everything we've talked about. Exactly. Here. Food. And how much is the supply for how big a family? This is for a family of four for three days. And again, we recommend that you, this not be your sole kit, but that you use this to augment or to supplement uh, other kits that you can make. Okay, quickly we'll go through. Here's the food, the, um, as you say, the health pack, the, the first, first aid, aid kit, right. another flashlight, another radio with extra batteries, uh, the towelettes, the tissues, whatever you're going to need. And uh, let's be frank about it. Uh, bathroom facilities are going to be uh, improvised exactly. under these circumstances. And this gives you paper and things that you might not think of right. otherwise. Here's a giant Ziploc pack of those water containers that we showed you before. And this has how many packs of water in it? 24. Though? 24. Here is uh, um, the space blanket right, again. Some space blankets. In addition to that, there's a two and a half gallon water bag uh, if you need to transport water. And in addition to that, you have a the uh, purification. purification tablets. All right. In the bag, you also have some batteries. Some and batteries. all of this. It's an optical illusion, fits in this bag, and it stows very nicely in the house, and is easily seen even in the dark uh, because of the reflector color of the bag. Now, you can pay whatever price for these, in some cases expensive, I'm sure, at a number of different stores, your survival stores, your earthquake stores, your sporting goods stores. You get a lot of speed when you do that. You can do it now, and your responsibility is over with. If you choose not to do that, you can also put your own survival kit together by making individual purchases at stores like your grocery store. There are several ways to make your own kit. The most important first thing you should have is, of course, is a good sturdy container and one that's mobile. Take the trash out of it first, I'm guessing. Of course. Okay. Another important thing to consider is when you're packing this container, make sure you put the things that are least important or not that essential at the bottom, working your way up, and have the most important things on the top. You mean on the top stuff you're going to get to first after it happens? Exactly. Okay. You want your flashlight, your extra batteries, fire extinguisher, your gloves, and, of course, your first aid kit. And don't forget about your reserve supply of money because the ATMs and credit card machines probably will not be working. Yeah, put, put you know, cash in a Ziploc container to mm -hmm. keep the water off of it. Also, small denominations. Right. Because when you're out there trying to buy a sandwich and whip out a $100 bill, chances are, after a disaster, nobody's going to have the correct change. Exactly. Right? And don't dip into your earthquake fund for pizza. That's right. Because it goes quickly. Okay. Lots of great stuff in here, Bill. Thank you very much. And at the end of this tape, we'll have a complete list of everything you need in this particular survival kit. Your important papers have to be readily accessible after an earthquake. As a matter of fact, you should have duplicates in a safety deposit box at your bank. Many people even keep the originals at the bank, too. In a fireproof security box like this one, Place the following. Your important papers, particularly insurance policies. Check earthquake insurance for fire, flood, and aftershocks. Your will, marriage license, credit card numbers, green cards, passports, and visas, additional money, and family pictures. Ugh, I never look good in earthquake pictures. But these are very important to you, both psychologically and if you become separated from a loved one, you may need a snapshot in helping to find them. A majority of the earthquakes that have occurred in Southern California over the past several years have been in the early morning hours. So, you could be in bed when the next quake hits. Under the bed is the place to store your first line essentials you'll need. And I put another flashlight under the mattress just in case my other one rolls away. In my kit, I've got spare glasses, sturdy shoes, a battery-powered radio, and, oh, ah, the old crowbar, just in case the bedroom door is jammed. 
It's best to keep all these together in one kit like we showed you earlier. You might be in your car when an earthquake occurs. That's why a survival kit in your trunk could be your lifeline. A better idea would be a backpack, which is a mini version of what you have at home. And I'd throw a blanket in the trunk just in case you have to sleep in the car and some good reading material. In your backpack you should have walking shoes, a flashlight, batteries, food and water, a radio, an extra set of clothes, a blanket, and a medical kit. A roll each of quarters and nickels wrapped tightly together with duct tape and kept under your seat could come in handy. And hide a spare key underneath your car just in case you lose the original. And of course, never let your gas tank get too low. You never know when gas stations will be open after a quake. And the lines could go on forever. You know, no matter where you are, it's important to be equipped for an emergency. For instance, here at the office, I have the following items, all important. Bottled water. I have a flashlight and spare batteries. I have gloves. I have food. I have, very important, spare keys. I have a radio. And most importantly, a good, sturdy pair of walking shoes. Most schools in California have a full program of earthquake preparation. But as a parent, you should make it your business to be informed about your child's school program for training, supplies, and pickup procedures. You should call your school's parent-teacher association to find out how prepared your school really is. Set up with your child a plan of where to meet if an earthquake occurs during school hours. Have an alternate guardian listed with the school. Make sure your child understands that after an earthquake, it may be some time before you're reunited. You know, it's very important for the whole family to become involved in earthquake preparation. It'll greatly reduce the stress level during and after. And it may just be the difference between life and death. Have calm family discussions about quakes. Emphasize that, sure, it's a very frightening experience, but you can ride them out. Plan and practice an emergency exit that will allow the whole family to get through and out of the house safely. Hold periodic earthquake drills, especially if you have children. Make a point of having the whole family sit down and together go through the earthquake information provided in the telephone book white pages. Get basic first aid instruction. The Red Cross, the YMCA, and other organizations offer first-rate courses. If you have an elderly or disabled relative or friend, have a buddy system set up to check on their well-being after a quake. Make sure your pets wear ID tags with name and telephone number at all times in case they're lost during the quake. Some animals despise collars, so you may want to look into a tattooed ID. For instance, my cat Cher has a butterfly tattoo and now dates male cats half her age. Every member of the family should carry an out-of-state phone contact in their wallet. That person can become an information hub for the entire family by advising other family members of your whereabouts or your well-being when phone lines are down or circuits are busy. Plan to have a place to reunite your family since travel may be difficult or even restricted after a major earthquake. Now, this may seem like an enormous amount of work, but if everyone pitches in, when the time comes, you'll be prepared. Okay. Okay. We're here in the Channel 4 newsroom, as you folks. There's no surprise. For any folks this morning, we've been hit with a major earthquake. How you behave during an earthquake is critical. The key is to remain calm and don't panic. If you have a plan and you've thought about it ahead of time, it'll be a lot easier for you. I'd like you to meet Libby Lafferty, who is an earthquake safety expert. Libby, isn't that true that calm is the key thing, especially at first? Absolutely, and yet it's not very easy to do. You need to just gather your grit and hang in there because if you do something dumb, that's when you're going to put yourself at risk. Okay, let's say that the earthquake is happening now. We'll take it step by step. And uh, just as a launch point, you're in your home. What do you do? Well, that depends a little bit on where you are in the time of day. Let's say that it's in the middle of the night, it's pitch dark, and you're sound asleep in your bed. 
you're very rudely awakened. The first thing, as we said, you need to do is to try to remain calm. The second thing that I would suggest is that you grab something like your pillow to protect your head and your neck. Most of us live in wood frame homes, and those are very good in an earthquake because they flex and bend. The problem is that they flex into the panes of glass in the windows, and those can implode or explode. So having something to protect your head and your neck is very helpful. That's something we started to do in my family, too, just as a result of past earthquakes, to get into the habit of at night pulling your shade down so that that would be uh, a buffer between you and flying shards of glass. Very good idea. In fact, we recommend that if you can stay in bed, you just scoot down, hang on, and ride out the shaking right there. That's probably the safest thing to do and what you should instruct your children to do. If, for example, the earthquake tosses you out of bed, then you need to roll, crawl, or stumble to a close-by safe place. And the best bed is under a sturdy desk, table, or even your bed if it's high enough off the ground. Okay. Then you put on the shoes that you should always have under your bed, and you grab the flashlight that should always be on your nightstand, and you check on the safety of the others in the home. That's right. In fact, uh, as you go through this process, sometimes uh, you decide there are even other things that you could use. And adding a pair of sturdy work gloves right with those shoes would be a good idea if there was broken glass or debris you had to pull away before you get to family members. The important thing to remember is that you want to stay put and hold on, whether you're under a sturdy piece of furniture or in that bed, and ride out the initial shaking. Mm -hmm. Do not run down the hall. Do not run downstairs. Do not run outside. Those are the places where you are going to run the greatest risk of getting injured. Okay, Libby, so it's maybe the middle of the day, and you're doing normal things, like you're in the shower. How do you react there? Well, the problem is that an earthquake doesn't give you much time. So the best thing you can do is to turn off the water, sit down in the bottom, and grab a towel, and just protect yourself the best you can, and once again, ride out the shaking. Actually, the bathroom and maybe even the shower stall could be a protective area because there's framing involved in there, right? Well, also, code says that the shower doors have to be safety glass so that if they break, they'll fall down in little pieces, but that won't be shards. Okay, I'm guessing the kitchen probably would not be the best place to be, but what if you're caught in there? Oh, boy. That is, that is a scary place. Uh, the best thing, of course, is to be sure that you have mechanical locks so that the doors of the cupboard stay closed. Nevertheless, um, you still need to get down and take protection the best you can, maybe at a kitchen table, and hang on. How about a doorway, Libby? For the longest time, we were all taught to go to the sturdy frame of a door, but as of late, opinion about that has changed. What do you think? That's true. Why don't I just show you? Okay, great. The front door is not a good place to stand during an earthquake. If you have this door open and it's heavy, it could swing on you and cause injury. There's often decorative glass at the side or somewhere in the area, top-heavy furniture, and the front porch may not be structurally attached to the house and be coming down. The chimney could be sliding off the roof at that point, or even loose tiles. So stay away from the front door during the shaking. Fritz, this doorway would probably be okay. The door is hollow core, it's light. This doorway leads into a hallway where there's nothing going to fall on you. I would suggest that you literally get down, put your back against the hinge side of the door, keeping the door from moving, that you hold the door jam and literally rock and roll with the motion until the shaking has stopped. Now, this is fine in a house, but in an office building, office building doors are fire doors and they're very heavy. So it's not a good place to be in a public or office building. Now, if you determine after the shaking stops that you are going to have to evacuate and leave the area, please remember to leave a message for family and friends, letting them know that you have gone, that you're okay, and where you've gone. Most of my aging baby boomer friends remember this old slogan from the Cold War, drop, cover, hold. For a few kids in earthquake country, the slogan still applies. Earthquake, drop, cover, and hold. 
Help! Come quick! Can I get out now, please? I need a chiropractor. If you're in your car, it's going to feel like you have four flat tires. Slow down, pull over to the side of the road, try to avoid bridges and overpasses and trees and power lines. Stay in your car and turn on your radio for information. After the shaking stops, drive away slowly. Check for damage to the road. And if you abandon your car, leave a note saying who you are and where you're headed. If you're in your office building, you got it. Under the desk, please. I cleaned it up nice under there for you. And don't run to the exits, because the stairways may be broken or jammed with people. And don't use the elevator. Now, I like to go to the movies. And many times, movie theaters are in shopping malls. If you find yourself in a shopping mall during a quake, calmly go to the nearest doorway or to the nearest store Go to the back of the store, away from any glass. You know, near the sale items. If you're in a stadium or sports arena, don't panic. Stay calm. After the shaking stops, then move to an exit in an orderly fashion. If you're in a movie theater, duck down between the seats. Don't panic. Your head will be protected from falling debris down here amongst the Skittles and the mashed raisinets. If you're outside, stay there. Avoid power poles, high buildings, walls, electrical lines. Don't run through the streets. If possible, move to an open area. If not, position yourself against a building or duck into a doorway. And I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to remain calm. It might just save your life. Quake in the area you are calling. Your call cannot be completed at this time. Please try your call later. Everything fell out of the closets. You couldn't get out a door. I couldn't find a flashlight. I had it laying where you can reach it. There's no way. It went underneath the bed. Take a deep breath and remain calm. This is where all your planning and preparation will pay off. Put on your sturdy shoes to avoid broken glass and debris. Locate your flashlight and your kit. Remember, an open flame can cause an explosion if there's a gas leak, so use only a flashlight. Put your family plan into motion. Check for injuries in your family and your immediate neighbors. Check for fires and fire hazards. Use your battery-powered radio for emergency information. Check for damage to your home. Do not evacuate unless necessary. Remove broken glass or hanging pieces that could be dislodged during aftershocks. When you have time, staple plastic or plywood over broken windows. Call your out-of-state contact. When you check for damage to your gas appliances, use only a flashlight, never an open flame. Don't operate electrical equipment either. A spark could cause an explosion. Listen for a hissing noise, or if you smell gas, shut off the valve to the appliance. If the gas is still leaking, then shut off the main valve. Don't turn it back on yourself. If there's damage to electrical wiring, switch off the main breaker. Remember to use gloves and safety glasses. Avoid downed power lines or anything touched by them. Immediately clean up any spilled medication or harmful substances, but with caution, because some household chemicals can be dangerous when mixed together. Be sure to use gloves. Remember, check your toilets for damage before using them and fill your bathtub immediately before your water becomes contaminated. If you turn your main water valve off, you can use water from the hot water heater or your toilet tank. You can also use water from your swimming pool, but not for drinking. Use it for washing or flushing the toilet. If your water out of the faucet is muddy, strain it through a clean cloth. Then boil it for 10 minutes before drinking. The same applies for the water used for cooking. If you can't boil your water, add eight drops of unscented household bleach or iodine to a gallon of clear water. Mix well and let stand for 30 minutes. If the water is cloudy, mix 16 drops per gallon. Eat refrigerated food first and then frozen food. 
Because even when the power goes off, if you keep the freezer door closed, frozen food can last up to three days. And then eat your canned and dried foods. But check the expiration date first. Remember, your pets will need food, and they should drink the same water that you drink. And keep them in the house for two or three days afterwards, because they'll be upset and may wander off. If you see a pay phone off the hook, replace it. Open phones tax the system. All right, just checking. Only use the telephone in an emergency, but if you can, notify your out-of-state contact about what's occurred. At home, make sure the phones are all on the hook, too. And disconnect them if you're going out, because an aftershock could knock them off again. Check your chimney for cracks or other damage. Check closets and storage areas. Open doors carefully, particularly in the kitchen. Be prepared for aftershocks. And be aware of the ongoing physical effects of aftershocks on you. My colleague Bruce Hensel has some important information on the subject. Oh. When aftershocks strike, many of us react the same way. From government officials... Looks like we had a little aftershock there, gentlemen. ...to little girls. But after the aftershock, many of us still feel shaky. There's just this incredible tension throughout my body. It's nervousness, just general tension. Those symptoms are real and physical. Whether you call them post-quake phantoms or jitters, they do cause real dizziness, nausea, even disorientation. And they may all occur because when the Earth moves, it doesn't just register on a seismograph. It affects your inner ear and throws your balance off. Sometimes I um, feel dizzy and I don't know if we're having a, you know, if the Earth's moving or if I'm just, you know, imagining it. If you experience any of that, don't panic. Relax. Breathe deeply. And if the feeling doesn't go away, drink plenty of fluids and ask your doctor if antihistamines may help. It's a scary time for all of us, but the aftershocks and the symptoms will disappear. A quake is going to have a big effect on your life. Here's Libby Lafferty again to answer some of your questions about things like your feelings and stress and sleep problems. An earthquake is an individual experience because no matter whether you're at home with your family, you still go through this pretty much by yourself. It happens without warning and you have that experience right where you are at the moment. And we do have to understand that not everybody is impacted to the same degree. We have to really not underestimate the psychological impact and venting those feelings is very therapeutic. The person who after a month's time is not getting any more comfortable and uh, less stressed, that's the person that needs to seek some help, get some counseling and begin venting those feelings and, and taking a close look at how they are reacting. We have to make sure that we're taking care of our own bodies. So eating well, maybe stay away from the alcohol and the caffeine. Uh, getting a lot of good exercise would be helpful. Taking a good hot soaking bath for a while to relax yourself before you go to bed. And then beyond that, make sure that your bedroom is physically safe. Things are bolted down and you now feel safe being in that room because you know you've done everything you can to make sure that it's secure. When the aftershocks tend to die down and they aren't occurring every day and things are calming down, then they can help you to make sure their rooms are also safe. Maybe you can install security lights that come on when the power goes off and then do some rehearsals and once again make sure that they are having nice comfortable bedtimes with with baths and, and soft music as you said and uh, nice stories and things and, and just set the tone for them and tell them that you know this need to be with you is important and understandable and that you're going to be right around the corner or in your bedroom if they need you and that it's time to begin to get back to normal you know it's gonna take a while 
before things get back to normal, especially in traffic. It's so important to keep the streets clear for emergency vehicles. So, no sightseeing. And if you're a surfer, don't get out of the beach and watch for a tsunami. I don't think so. And one more thing. Oh, excuse me. Hello? What? I don't believe that. Don't hand me that. Look, after a quake, rumors fly. If somebody said there was a Tyrannosaurus Rex in Sherman Oaks, would you believe them? Well, you see, it's the same after an earthquake. Don't be a part of spreading misinformation. It only makes matters worse. Well, that's our video. I hope you find it useful. More important, I hope you use the information. Please, don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. There is a lot to do, but there are a lot of folks who can help you. We've got more information coming up at the end of this tape, so grab a pencil and paper. You'll need your pause button to copy it. And remember, it's not a matter of if an earthquake hits, it's when it hits. The most vital person to you and your family's safety is you.